Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to revisit a topic that we've covered previously on the channel, and that is NTFS MACB timestamps. So why the revisit? Well, it all started because I was doom scrolling on Twitter the other day and ran across a cool article talking about some differences in the way some of the timestamps are tracked within Windows 11. And that got me thinking that I should probably make an updated timestamp video anyway, specifically for people who are new to Windows Forensics, because there's still a lot of confusion with regards to how those timestamps work. If you step back and think about it, most people new to Windows Forensics are only aware of the existence of three timestamps. That's it, just three. The very three that are exposed via the Windows API and via Windows Explorer. That would be modification, access, and creation or birth. So that would be the M, the A, and the B timestamps within the Mac B nomenclature. Whereas C would be an NTFS MFT record change. So a metadata change. That timestamp, the C timestamp, is not exposed to us via the Windows API and therefore is not available at the command prompt or within Windows Explorer. Let's talk about in this video just the very basics. And at the end, I will show the article that I mentioned talking about the differences with regards to certain timestamps and how they're tracked in Windows 11. But really, the main focus of this video is just going to be in covering the basics. So if you're a seasoned DFIR investigator, this is not the episode for you, but feel free to hang around. In fact, please do hang around. But if you're new to the field, well, this is for you. As you can see, I have a blank Windows Explorer window pulled up here, and we're looking at the desktop. By default, the date modified column is turned on. That's the M timestamp in Mac B. But I also turned on the A date accessed and the B date created. Remember, B is for creation or birth. The C is for the metadata change. All right, so these are our three available timestamps right here. So let's perform a series of different actions and see how these timestamps behave. First up, let's right click and go to new text document and I'll just type in 13 cubed and there we go. So now we've created a new file called 13 cubed.txt and in a surprise to no one, all three timestamps are set to the current local time as I'm recording this when the file was created. That would be 3.44 p.m. You can see the M, the A and the B are all set to the same timestamp. That should be intuitive and make sense to you. Nothing special about that. Let's talk about what happens if I double click this file to open it. Would you agree that if I double click the file to open it, I am in fact accessing the file? I mean, of course I am, right? It has to access it to actually show us the contents, even though in this case, the contents are nil, empty. But still, let's just do that. Let's double click it. It opens up a blank window, nothing here, and then I'll close it. And now I'll press F5 to refresh. The current local time is 3.45 p.m., but did the access date update? to 3.45 p.m.? No, it did not. It did not update, it's still 3.44 p.m. And if you're not new to Windows Forensics, that concept will not be news to you. But again, if you are new, that probably doesn't behave the way you expect it to. Since Windows Vista and later, all of the operating systems have a registry value set. I believe it's something like NTFS disable last access update or last update, something like that. I'll throw it on the screen. But interestingly, this value has undergone several different iterations. Originally, it was either a zero or a one, meaning that either the access timestamp would be tracked or it would not be tracked. In later builds of Windows 10, it was modified such that it could be any of four different values as you see on screen. At that point, as long as the OS drive was less than 128 gigs, the access timestamp would be tracked. Then later it was changed again, such that it was always set to be tracked regardless of the size of the OS volume. And that remains the current setting even in Windows 11. However, in my experience, and as you just saw, that doesn't manifest itself in the way you would expect. The timestamp was not updated when we accessed the file. In fact, the access timestamp will be updated on a number of different cases but a lot of them are cases in which you probably wouldn't expect the timestamp to be updated, yet it seems to be updated. The takeaway here is do not draw any conclusions based on the A timestamp. It is probably the most useless timestamp in all of Windows, in my opinion. 
Don't depend on it for anything. It's there, but it just doesn't behave the way you might expect. All right, next up for our third test, we need to double click on this file and this time I'm going to actually modify it. So I'll type in hello world and we'll go ahead and close it and click save. The current local time is 347 and right before your very eyes, you should have seen these two timestamps get updated. Now the modification timestamp being updated to 3.47 p.m. because we modified the file should be a surprise to no one, right? We modified the contents of the file, thus the modification timestamp was updated. Makes total sense, right? You can see that it's set to 3.47. What you may not have expected is that also the access timestamp was updated in this case to the same time, 3.47 p.m. So both of the modification and access timestamps were updated as a result of me modifying the contents of the file. Of course, the creation timestamp remains 3.44 p.m., which makes sense because something can only be created or born once. So obviously that's not going to change when we modify the contents. Okay, so far so good. Let's try something else. Let's rename the file. What I'll do is click on this and then we'll just put a two at the end, 13 cubed two dot text. Okay, I'll press F5 to refresh. The current local time is 3.48 p.m. And as you can see, none of the three timestamps have been updated to 3.48 p.m. Nothing happened. Actually, something did happen to the C timestamp, the timestamp that we cannot see here. So that reflects a metadata change. And in fact, renaming the file is absolutely a metadata change for the file. Did we modify the contents of the file by renaming it? No, we didn't. So it makes sense that the M timestamp would not have changed but we did change the metadata, much the same if we added a system hidden or read-only attribute or change the security permissions of the file or again, rename the file like we did. Any of those things will be examples of things that would change the metadata of the file, which would update that C timestamp, the MFT record change timestamp. Again, we can't see it via the normal Windows API within Windows Explorer or even at the command prompt, but we can see it in special tools and we would know that that timestamp is updated as a result of that. Okay, so what next? Well, next up, let's practice a file copy and see what happens with that. So I'll right click and go to new folder and I'll create a new folder called test. All right, new folder called test. What I want to do at this point is copy 13cube2.txt into test. I'm going to right click on this and choose the copy icon. Then I'm going to go into test, right click and choose the paste icon. There we go. You've learned how to copy and paste something in a 13 cubed episode. How exciting. No, but seriously, we've now made a copy of the file. So let's take a look at what happened. The creation timestamp is set to 350, the current time. That's the time the copy occurred. The access timestamp is set to the same. The date modified though is set to 347 PM. Why? Looking at this at face value, it appears that the file was modified before it even existed. Make sense? Well, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but if you look at it, it says it was modified at 3.47 p.m., but it was only created at 3.50 p.m., so how is that even possible? Well, anytime you see this paradox, it's almost always indicative of a file copy, because when you copy a file, the M timestamp, the modification timestamp, tags along for the ride. And yes, that does even apply across UNC paths, across like network shares. So for, for example, imagine a threat actor connecting to a UNC path under his or her control, and the threat actor copies evil.exe from that file share onto the victim machine. The M timestamp would come along for the ride. And if you don't believe me, I'll just show you right here. Here's the original file, 3.47 p.m. And again, if we go back here, same modification timestamp, 3.47 p.m. So that is a key concept to learn. Again, that's one of the first things you learn when you learn about Windows NTFS timestamps. And if you're new to forensics, you know, maybe that's something you didn't know. So keep that in mind. That is a key concept. Anytime you see the modification, which seems to uh, paradoxically, you know, not be correct because it exists before the creation, then again, you're probably looking at a file copy. All right. So what's next? Well, let's check out file moves. So what I'm going to do here is right click and create another folder here. I'll just call it, uh, I don't know, how about test two? Super creative with my naming here. 
So test2 is a brand new folder or directory, nothing in it. What I'm going to do at this point is move this. Before I do, let's take a look at the original timestamps. We have 347, 347, 344, okay? So I'm gonna take this and drag it into here. Again, remember 347, 347, 344. So I moved it, we open it up, and what has happened here? Well, it looks like we still have the 347 modification. We have still the 344 creation, but what's up with this? The access timestamp is now 350. The current local time is 352. So how does that make any sense at all? It's not even updated to the current local time that the move occurred. It's updated to a time approximate to the time the move occurred. That's weird. Not sure why that happens, but just note that the access timestamp has updated to a value approximate to the time the move occurred. But as I said previously, don't depend on the access timestamp for anything. It is not your friend. It updates in weird ways that are seemingly inexplicable. I'm sure there is a logical explanation for why it works like this, but just know that got updated in a way that I would have not expected. Okay, let's try one more thing. Let's move this back from this location to where it was, but this time let's use the command prompt. So what I'll do is I'll go into the desktop directory under test2, and here's the file right here, right? 13cube2.txt. So what I'm going to do is just move this up a level. So I'll go move 13cube2.txt dot dot. So that moves it up a level. And at this point, of course, it's empty here. And if I go back to the desktop, here it is. Did anything happen here? Well, it looks like the access timestamp remained 350. The modification timestamp remained 347. And the creation timestamp remained 344. Interesting. So it didn't get updated when I moved it back. Let's try one more thing just to see if this was a fluke. I'll create a new folder called test3. And now let's move it again, but this time I'll move it just the way I did the first time, just by dragging it in here. So there we go. I moved it into test3. And it looks like, no, it still says 350, 344, 347. Uh, so again, just the same as it was when we moved it the first time. But that is definitely a difference that I would not have expected. So I wanted to call that out to your attention. But if you heed my advice and just kind of ignore the access timestamp for the most part, then that's not going to really affect you anyway. Okay, so that is a quick look at the behavior of these timestamps when we perform simple operations. In the originally published version of this episode, I incorrectly stated that these timestamps were being pulled from dollar standard underscore information within each file's MFT file record. That is incorrect. As a viewer noted here, the timestamps displayed by Windows Explorer are actually coming from the dollar file underscore name attribute of the index record. That is the dollar I30 structure that we've covered in other 13 cubed episodes. This is not to be confused with the same attribute type in the file record. It does not come from dollar standard underscore information. And it turns out the dollar file underscore name attribute of the index record can be slightly out of date when compared to the dollar standard underscore information attribute of the file record as noted in the comment here. So again, shout out to this viewer and to someone else on Reddit who pointed this out. I apologize for the mistake. I think this is the first time I've had to pull a 13 cubed episode and republish it to correct something but I want to make sure the information presented is accurate. So again, apologies. Now let's go ahead and move on to the final section of this episode. Check the video's description for a link to this page. If I were you, I would bookmark it because this is a very handy reference, as you'll see. Let's start with standard information. Note that the chart shows last access time, A, behaves differently in Windows 11 for file modification, file rename, file copies, and file moves. That said, my results differ from some of these. Granted, my sample size is three, the host machine I'm using to create this episode, a Windows 11 sandbox running on it, and a separate Windows 11 laptop. For example, in my testing, and as you saw earlier, a file rename did not update the access time. Interestingly, also note that many of the times now show approximate values in Windows 11. For the C timestamp, noted as metadata time, there are some key changes for file copies, and file moves as noted here. Now let's look at file name. Note that modification M access A 
and metadata change C timestamps differ in Windows 11 for file renames, local file moves, and file recycled events. Very interesting. Admittedly, I've not had time to test all of these scenarios, and I suspect the community will continue to update its findings as Windows 11 continues to expand into more and more enterprise environments. All right, that wraps up everything I wanted to cover in this episode. As always, thank you for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.